Welcome to the Bridge Fellowship Online. We are so glad that you are here, and we hope that this message encourages you today. To find more information about our church or future events, go to tbfonline.net. You know, um, Steve Jobs was known as one of the most brilliant minds, one of the most brilliant business minds ever. And he and his friend, Steve Wozniak, decided that they were going to build a computer in their garage, and they really didn't set out to become millionaires. They just set out to build a computer for each other and and a few close friends. But in 2003, Steve Jobs was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, and although he had all the money that he had worth billions of dollars, he had every medical person around that he could have had the best medical care. In 2011, he still passed. Kobe Bryant, arguably one of the greatest basketball talents ever. Him and his daughter and seven other people could not control a helicopter going down in the hills of Southern California. So the question is, what do you or a family member of yours have that you can't control, that is beyond your control. And I think that if if we got honest, we would probably say that the greatest struggle that we have in our life is when we realize that we can't control something. I would tell you that in my darkest days of depression and anxiety, it was because of something in my life that I realized that I couldn't control. I think for you as a mom, if you have young kids, I think you continue to struggle with what is the balance of not being a control freak as a mom and allowing them to be brave, even spiritual brave with some things in your life and not to be that control freak. Because let me tell you, as a mom with young kids, let me tell you right now, you better tell everybody about what a great parent you are because eventually they're going to become teenagers and adults and nobody thinks you're a good parent at that point. All right. So tell everybody now about what a great parent you are. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 7, and we're going to see a man in Scripture that realized that he had a circumstance that he could not control. So again, what do we do? What do we do when things get out of control on us? And no matter where you are, no matter what your spiritual age, no matter if you're young in the faith or if you are mature in the faith and you're older in your faith, we all struggle with this reality of this thing called faith and how it's supposed to work in our life with the situations and the circumstances we can't control. So in Luke chapter seven, we're gonna get there, but remember, Luke is writing to a friend by the name of Theophilus. He's, he's, he's telling them that, hey, this is the man that we've heard about. Jesus, the Messiah, has shown up and he is the Messiah. And so he's convincing him of this and he's writing to him and giving him things about Jesus' life and excerpts of Jesus' life. And here in Luke chapter seven, we see what happens because we see again the authority of Christ and Luke writes this to his friend. So we're gonna read verses one and two together and then we'll track through the the rest of the text together. So can I ask you if you would stand with me as we honor the reading of scripture. When Jesus had finished saying all this, and when it talks about saying all this, he's just come off of, of, of preaching, teaching the sermon on the plain with his 12 disciples along with a whole lot of other people that have begun to follow Jesus because of the authority he has and because of the miracle he's doing. So that's what it's referring to when, he, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening to him, he entered Capernaum. Now Capernaum was his hometown. I mean, that, I'm sorry, not his hometown. That's where his home base of ministry was. And so this is where he was. This is what takes place. And in verse two, it says, there a centurion servant whom his master value highly was sick and about to die. So the centurion was at what we would know of to, in today's rank. This would be a, a captain in the army. And so he is over probably a hundred people, maybe even more, but he's got a problem. And the problem is, is that his servant, now that word servant, I would tell you to circle that word. If you've got the word slave in your text, that's a better translation of the word. That his slave, okay, whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die. So this centurion, he's got great integrity. He cares for his servant. He honors his servant. But can I tell you, at the end of the day, the centurion has a problem. The servant has a problem. 
He's got a circumstance they can't control. He is fixing to die. So with us, how does faith play out in our life? We hear a lot about this, about how faith's supposed to play out. Because in Hebrews chapter 11, it says this about our own faith. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So does that mean if I have faith, I can say whatever and Jesus is going to do it? Or how is this circumstance that we have, how does faith, how is it played out? So if we want to mature in our faith, we need to understand that we have to trust God with circumstances that we cannot control. I pray you'll take some notes, all right? I'm glad you're here. Let's pray together. God, thanks for today. Thanks for your people. God, I'm just really honored. I think I can speak for all my staff. We're honored that we get to serve here to such a great group of people. So Lord, would you bless the reading of your scripture? God, as Paul would say, would you bless the foolishness of the preaching of the word of God? And so Lord, let us laugh together. So Lord, let our hearts be challenged about this subject called faith. In Jesus' name that we pray and everybody says, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. So I'm gonna give you three views of faith. So here we go. Take some notes. First view of faith is God, you should. So, because we're a Christ follower and we've given our life to Christ. And when we give our life to Christ, I am praying, I'm believing by faith. And so when I get sick, I'm believing by faith that God, you're gonna heal me. When my parents get sick, I'm gonna pray God that you heal them. When my grandparents get sick, God, I'm praying that you heal them. And so God, I'm praying you come through financially, that God, I don't lose my job, that God, I get a new job, you'll bless my business. But let me tell you, when we are like this and we're saying, God, I expect you to do this, we're exact, we, exact, we have the exact mindset of the religious crowd. Look what it says in verses three through five. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal a servant. Now, before we go to verse four, let me tell you about verse three here, okay? Is that Matthew records the same miracle as Luke does. But in Matthew, okay, it says, it says a little different. It says the centurion went to Jesus, but here it says that the centurion sent for the elders to go to Jesus. So, this is when people take these kind of things and look at them and go, okay, see right here? In Matthew it says this, in Luke it says this. This is a contradiction of scripture. Therefore, that's why you can't trust scripture. So which is true, Matthew or Luke? Well, both and are true. Because see, Matthew was written first and he was the first one to write it. And all Luke is doing is coming along behind him and he's adding to the story. He's building on with some details of the story. And so, when he says this, the elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and to heal a servant. And they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this. So in other words, God, you should do this. Next verse. Because this is why you need to do this, Jesus. He loves our nation and has built our synagogue. There was nothing that the religious crowd stood up and cheered for more than their nation called Israel and the synagogue. I mean, they loved it. So this guy, this centurion, he either was a major contributor of the synagogue or he was the sole contributor of the synagogue. And so when you look at this, when they come to Jesus, what happens is, is that you see this view of faith, this first view of faith is that God, you should. They build their faith based on the external and not the internal. So what happens is, is that their presentation of faith to Jesus, it is surface at best. We can be the same way because we call ourselves Christ followers. We show up we read the Bible. We have this tendency to think that God should come through for us the way that we think that God should come through for us. And so if I could explain it this way, when Shara and I were, uh, were much younger and had much younger kids, when we would go eat, we would always go and eat at O'Charlie's. Now tell me why we went to O'Charlie's. Kids eat for free, right. Now, if you go there now to O'Charlie's on Wednesday, it's free pie, okay? So there's a bonus deal. But let me just tell you, okay? Is that Sharon and I still say that to this day that when COVID happened, 
Oh, Charlie's was one of the few places that actually had servers and the service was good and the food was good. Now, all you younger people here, you have no concept of what I'm talking about with O'Charlie's and real food because none of you ever go to O'Charlie's because you're all about the burger. I mean, that's the hip kind of joint, you know, because you're just about red meat and two pieces of bread. And that's basically all a hamburger is. It is a bread piece of meat with a bun on each side of it. Now, they add some things to trick you to make it be a lot better than it is. But at the end of the day, it's a piece of meat with a bun on each side. That's all it is. Now, the way they trick you youngsters is this. Oh, you can get skinny fries. Can I tell you what skinny fries are? That's french fries cut in half. That's all that is, all right? Don't buy that stuff, all right? Or you can get tater tots. Or if you're really honored and valued by God, then you can have sweet potato fries, all right? So that's what happens where you go to McDonald's. That's not even a real hamburger, but you go there, all right? And so when you think about it, it's that we would go and we would go there. But, and let me tell you, something that I used to be terrible with that illustrates my point here, I'm doing better. I'm not where I need to be, but I'm doing better. When we would go out, for some reason, my order was always wrong. And then when they brought food to me and it was food that was supposed to be hot, it was cold. There's nothing worse than having food that's supposed to be hot and it shows up cold. And then I would, I, I would say things and I would be really ugly to my server. Now, I'm just being honest, okay? I'm not telling you I was right. I'm just being honest, all right? So when all this began to take place, our kids, our kids would look at Shara and they, they wouldn't say a word, but everybody knew what they were saying to Shara when they were looking at her. Mom, would you please rescue us because daddy is fixing to embarrass the mess out of us. He's going to go to a manager. He's going to demand that he give him free pie. He's going to demand that they pay for his meal. And please, Mom, rescue us from the situation. And I mean, I would get on to my server like it was her fault or his fault. It wasn't their fault. It was just a miscommunication. But see, I was demanding. I was entitled. I, I deserve something. That's exactly the picture of how we are with our faith because we possess the Holy Spirit. We think we can say, God, you should. So I'm entitled. So God, I'm expecting you to come through in the circumstance I can't control. I need you to come through for it just like I need you to come through with it. God, you should. The second kind of faith is, God, I am prone to wonder. Basically put, I know me, I know my heart, and I know that I'm prone to wonder. If God honest, we don't deserve anything that God gives us. Chapter 7, verse 6 and 7. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That's verse. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. He's saying, Lord, I, I don't deserve this. I don't, I don't even deserve for you to come under my house. See, when we live in this balanced thing called faith, it's a balance that says we cannot be stranger to our own sin. In other words, we have to own our sin. We have to understand that our heart wonders, but we also need to understand that we bear the image of Christ, and there's a balance there. But see, as church people, what we usually do, we distance ourselves from terrible sinners such as Jeffrey Dahmers, Ted Bundy's, Andrea Yates, who would drown all of her babies in the water. We distance ourselves from them because they are monsters and we could never be that. But we might not be serial killers or adulterers. Let us all remember that our heart great tendency to wander from God and to live in our sin. And the centurion understood that when he thought that he was unworthy of meeting Jesus. And so we're all prone to wonder. And so we need to understand this. So let me give you a statement. It's going to be on the screen. I want you to see it. The balance of faith and the reality of faith 
is knowing who Christ is. In other words, I know that Jesus died for me. I know that he gave his life for me. And you know what? The fact that I'm getting heaven and then I'm missing hell is only because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. I had nothing to do with that. God in his infinite wisdom and his love for you and I, he sent Jesus to the cross for us. So in other words, I had nothing to do with that. But we're knowing who Christ is. And by knowing who Christ is, I'm completing Christ. I don't lack anything. I am fulfilled in Jesus because the Spirit of God that lives in me and the Spirit of God is always in is always with me. I'm knowing who Christ is, but I'm knowing who we are. In other words, I know who I am in Christ, but also that I have to understand that we are prone to wonder. So let me illustrate this way. A lot of you students just got back from camp about a week ago. Some of you adults, you got back from camp, you got camp as well. And even if you didn't go to camp, the illustration is still going to work for you as well. So you think about when we, when we go to camp, when you go to camp, our youth staff really doesn't do but about two things. Now, they do them really well, but there's two things that they focus on. Number one is that they make sure that they put you in community. So for the first time in a long time, maybe even as far as you can remember, for the first time, the thing that doesn't own you, that doesn't run your life, is your cell phone. For an adult, the thing that doesn't run you or own you is media or, or, or your emails. And so in other words, they put you in community that where you actually have to have a conversation with a person. I mean, a real person, not like a blow up kind of doll. I mean, a real person, all right? So you have a conversation and you have community with them. Everything you do is with community. And so then the second thing that they do is they put you in position to hear from God, whether that's a a Bible study in the morning, whether that's a breakout session, whether that's at night and the teaching, or it's with your small group and you're discussing biblical principles, or you're sitting with God alone and you're learning to hear from God. So you come back and you come back from camp. So ask yourself, because you've been back from camp for about a week. Are you still seeking God now like you did at camp? Or is the only community you've got now, is it your phone again? This is not just for teenagers. This is for adults as well. All you do is scroll through your phone. Do you, I mean, is God the first priority for you or is your phone your first priority? You see, what happens is, is that the reason that happens, we can look at it and go, that's just the way it is. No, no. The reason that it is, is, and let me just say, you can leave and see the concept in worship happen as well. Because you know what? You get to camp. And you know what? You have a kid or even an adult. You have, and, and I'm not saying that this is, This, by any means, is something you have to do. But the freedom in camp is, it doesn't take but about the second day, and all of a sudden, you're looking around, and adults and teenagers who've never lifted their hands in worship, they're lifting their hands. My grandson, Levi, asked me, his sister Lydia, she's in second grade, right? Me in third. Second, finish second grade. All of a sudden, I show him a picture. He goes, hey, Paul, all these people are doing like that. I wanted to be a smart elk and go, oh, they got, they got a question. They were asking a question, right? I didn't, and I said, oh, they're worshiping. Without even flinching, he said, about his sister who just got out of second grade. Oh, Lydia does that. He doesn't understand the importance of that yet. In camp, we go all the way up. What happens? and yet really want God to be really close to the Lord. Got your earbuds on with some praise. So see, when you come to church, you know why people quit lifting their hands? So now where God is not a priority in your life with listening to the word, what happens to us is, is that why does it happen? Simply for this reason. Our heart is Third view of faith. Third view, God, my faith has found a resting place. And I think we all would say, you know what, this is, this is where I want to be. Because through everything that we face, with the circumstances we cannot control, how can our faith find a resting place? Because I think that's where we want. We want this kind of peace that God gives us, that our, that our faith does find a resting place. And, and I will tell you, okay, let me, let me just tell you this. You hear all these TV preachers say this. So if you hear a TV preacher say this, 
it will be your first clue. Turn off the TV and don't listen to this guy or listen to this lady, all right? Don't listen to him, all right? When you hear somebody say, oh, just trust your heart. Don't ever trust your heart. You know what the scripture says about your heart? Above all else, it is evil. That's what it says. So you don't trust your heart. Why do I trust? You trust the word of God. That's what you trust. The word of God will never ever steer, will never steer you wrong. And so he said, you see, we need to make sure that we are trusting we are trusting what God has for us. So in that, how does my faith find a resting place? Look at verse seven. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. Come to you. Second part of the verse. But say the word and my servant will be healed. Now, think about this. Here's a guy that just says, just say the word. I, I don't even need you to come to my house. I just need you to say the word from where you are and, and it can happen. I mean, so... What is it, okay? So how does our faith, our faith find a resting place? I got two steps that I wanna give you and they're outlined in the text, all right? So how does our faith find a resting place? Here's the first way, is that we trust the power of Jesus. I mean, this is a guy. I mean, he just says, all you got, if you'll just speak the name, just speak it and it can happen. I mean, you think about trusting the power of who Jesus is. Now, you see, what we've got, that this Roman centurion didn't have was, is that we've got post-miracle. We've seen what happens after the miracle. We've seen that Jesus went to a cross and died for us, that he was raised from the dead. He ascended to the Father. The Holy Spirit descended on the church and the church was formed. And now for the first time ever, the Spirit of God lives and resides in people for eternity. And because of all that, we see all that. Folks, I'm gonna tell you, we can trust the power of Jesus. I mean, just speaking, it can happen. And I wouldn't even tell you. Oh my goodness, if you're struggling, thinking, I don't know what to do next. Here's Michael Jenkins' daughter just interrupted worship in front of everybody, all right? Are you embarrassed? So when you think, you have, you, you have completely, I don't even know where, where was I at? What? what about, trust the power of Jesus, thank you, all right. So, how could I forget that, right? All right. So you trust the power of Jesus. So let me just say, if you're in a place to where you're thinking, how can my faith become reality and you don't know what to do? Just speak the name. Amen. Just speak the name Jesus. Speak the name. See, and I will tell you, I, I don't really struggle with this one because I've seen God work and, I've, and, and through history, we've all seen him work. We can... We can trust the power of Jesus. We can trust what, what he does for us. But you see, where we struggle is in the second step of the faith because this is where we all have a hard time to really allow our faith to find a resting place. Yeah, I can trust his power. I mean, I can trust him to do things that only can do like he, we sang about it. He sets the stars in motion. He shed his blood for salvation. He does all the, he, he set creation in motion. He did all that. We can trust the power, but... The second part, the second step, it's the most difficult part. And the second step is this. We trust the authority of Jesus. It's one thing to trust his power, but then to trust his authority. So when we begin to trust his authority, we move, write this down, we move from hesitancy to trust. And how many times do we get a chance to trust God in our lives? get to trust God when somebody's sick and we get to pray for healing. We have a loss of a job and God says, trust me, whatever, trust me in this. Or that God's given us an opportunity to have, to have, to have more courage in our faith and he gives you an opportunity to pray with a close friend or even pray with a stranger. He gives you those opportunities. But he gives you the opportunity to share Christ with a friend or share Christ with somebody that you've run into or even invite somebody to church or even trust God enough with your own finances that you would trust his word and that you would begin tithing because you see what happens is, is that it is one thing to say, I trust his power. But when we say we trust his authority, then you know what happens is that then we choose to obey what he tells us to do. Yes. So you have to ask yourself, do I, want to, do I want to obey God? And so let me just say is that tonight we have growth track. Now, Growth Track, if you're not sure what that is and you haven't been around here long, that's for people who say, you know, the, the Breach Fellowship, that's, that's, that's gonna be my church. We ask you to go through Growth Track. I mean, we, we, 
we give you the best food in the world. Free. That's the best, all right? It's free food. It's free child care. I mean, what a, what a deal that is, right? So when you, you come and you hear about who we are, about how we got started, and about what our vision is, and so I really would encourage you to sign up for that. It starts at 5 o'clock. Dinner's at 5. We do child care. We do dinner for you and your kids. You can go to the Church Center app, and you can sign up. You can see one of our staff and sign up. But let me encourage you to sign up and to go through Growth Track. But in every Growth Track, I share the same story. Now, I'm going to fix and share this story. So if you come tonight, you're going to hear the story again. I just need you to, tonight, I just need you to smile at me and act like you've never heard it and go, well, that's a great story, all right? So the story is this. When we begin, when Sharon and I began to pray about planning the Bridge Fellowship, I kind of knew that, okay, this is probably what God's calling, but God called me to, but I had decided, I mean, I could trust the power of Jesus. Okay, it needs to happen and God is faithful, but I didn't want to obey. As a matter of fact, I even got to the point that I just said, I'm not going to do this because the fear of starting the church scared me to death. And I'm in our previous church and I'm fixing to walk up and to preach on Sunday night. And my wife looks at me and she says, hey, can I ask a question? I said, yeah. She goes, can you tell me a time where we had, where we had to trust God by faith when he didn't take care of us? I said, yeah. She said, then I'm going to start now. And then she looked at me and she said, don't you know this side? Let me tell you, as a preacher of the gospel, there is nothing that would incur, that will encourage your soul more that you're fixing to walk up to preach and your wife just told you, if you don't do this, you're going to miss God. That will encourage you. Let me just tell you, all right? You know, you want to look at her and go, I, I don't need another Holy Spirit in my life. I've already got enough, right? But the other two people that said the same thing, my dad, and other than my wife, the best friend I've got in the world, my brother, Joel B. And they both said the same thing to me. If you don't do this, you're going to miss God. See, I can trust his power, but am I going to trust his authority when God tells me to do it? So, and I'll say this at every growth track. The reason you're sitting in your seat is not because of my faith. It's because it shares faith. And so, when you think about this, what is it God's calling you to do to trust his authority to obey him in? What is he asking, what, what, what is he asking you to do that you really don't want to do. See, trust in his authority will always depend it on his holiness of who he is. But you see, you have to trust the relationship that you have with Christ. So how, do, how can we be willing to trust his authority? Look what it says in verse 9 and 10. When Jesus heard this, you remember what he had just heard? He just heard what the guy said, just speak. You know what's really interesting about this? Jesus never spoke it. Never did he say, be healed. Hey, get up. He never said any of that. Look what it says. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. That word amazed, there's two times that word is used in the New Testament. The first time it's used is when Jesus is referring to his, his hometown, Nazareth, and he said he was amazed by their lack of faith. And the second time it was used was not about a Jewish person, but about a Roman soldier. He was amazed at him and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such a great faith even in Israel. Verse 10. Then the men who had, who had, been, who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. When did he heal him? I have no idea. I think it was when he says, hey, you can just speak it. I think at that point, Jesus just thought it and it happened. That's the power that Jesus had. But you see, what we do is that we take this text and we kind of take it out of its context and we go, okay, Jesus, I need for you to do the same thing for me. I need for you to make sure that you, you need to heal this person. You need to make sure that you do this for me. And what happens is, is that when we have to understand that the, most, the thing that God is more interested in, interested in in anything is your relationship with Christ. And so when we think about this, it's about trusting the relationship that you have with Christ. 
Will God heal? I've seen God heal. Absolutely he can heal. Does that mean that God's always gonna heal? Let me tell you, sometimes God will heal in the moment and give you more years to live here. But can I tell you also what you're gonna find out about this Roman centurion and what you find out about next week's story as well is that eventually they're gonna die. They are going to die. And so guess what happens? God heals them again and heals them ultimately in a place called heaven. See, we forget that heaven is our real home. We think this is our real home. This is not home. You're passing through here for just a few years and you will spend eternity, millions of years in a place called heaven. And so when you think about Jesus and the fact that what he's doing here is that we have to trust the relationship. You know those people that know you so well that know exactly what you need? That's my wife for me. She knows exactly, she knows me so well. She knows what I need and what I don't need. But can I tell you, as much as she loves me and cares for me and how well she knows me, she doesn't know me like the great I am. And there's nobody that knows you like the great I am. And guess what he does for you? is that he wants you to trust him because he's a good God, he's a gracious God, and he will meet every need you have according to not your riches, but his riches in Christ Jesus. So, are we going to trust that? See, there has not been one service that's even close. You didn't actually clap for me. You got close to clapping. The first two, it wasn't even a thought on the radar, right? That's, thank you. That's why you're the best, all right? But there's a story about a man who had to decide if he was going to trust by faith or if he would just choose to fulfill his own desire in the moment. The story goes that there was a man traveling in the desert on foot, fixing to die of thirst. And all of a sudden he stumbled upon an old shack in the desert. And when he got there, he found a shady part of the shack. He sat down and all of a sudden around the corner, there was an old pump. And he thought to himself, it's a water pump. I can have water. He then begins to pump and there's no water. And he continues to pump and there's no water. And all of a sudden, about 15 feet away, he sees a jug. And on the jug, it says, the pump has to be primed with the full jug of water. P.S. Make sure you fill the jug for the next traveler. And sure enough, he opens the top, it's full of water. He has a dilemma. Do I drink the water and stay alive for a few hours? Or do I prime the pump and pour all the water on the pump? He decides that he's gonna pour all the water on the pump. He pours it all, no water left. And all of a sudden he begins to pump that pump. The screeching sounds the bad sounds as he begins to pump, no water. He goes back and he pumps again, no water. He pumps the third time, same sounds, no water. The fourth time he pumps, the water begins to dribble. He begins to pump and pump and pump and pump and water becomes gu- just starts gushing out. He fills a water bottle and he drinks He fills it again, he drinks again, fills again and drinks again. And then he drinks to his heart's desire. Then he fills a bottle again, takes a marker out of his backpack and he says, and he wrote on the jug, believe me, it works. So see, when you choose to live by faith, it just doesn't affect you, it affects affects somebody else around you. But the question that you got to ask, if you want to drink from the well that never runs dry, you have to first possess the person that's the only one that can give you faith. Because on your best day, you don't have enough about you that can get you from point A to point B without messing things up. Only Jesus in you can direct you and to give you faith in the peace of an Situation, a circumstance that you cannot control. So first of all, you got to possess him. Now once you possess him, 
the question you got to ask is, am I, am I going to continue to drink from the well? Can I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes?